And hello, everybody, and welcome into our Clubhouse Conversations. New time as we've moved it to 530 uh, Central Time here tonight uh, for our Clubhouse Conversations. I'm Lane Grindle from the Brewers Radio Network, and it's great to be with you. We have had some great guests over the last couple of weeks. We've had Sal Bando, Brent Suter, Cecil Cooper, Jeff Cirillo, and we're really excited for our guest here tonight, former Brewers General Manager, Doug Melvin joining us here on Clubhouse Conversations. And Doug, it is always good to catch up with you. Uh, you, you are a great baseball man. Everybody that has ever come across you understands that and talks about that. Uh, a, a man with many stories, many experiences in the game. And uh, we're just looking forward to, to talking a little baseball with you tonight. And it's, a good, it's good timing because the crew won three out of four over the weekend with the Chicago Cubs. Good to see you, Doug. How are you? Yeah, good to see you, Lane. I always said these interviews are great uh, coming off a winning streak. You know, <laughs> the timing is good. They've had a good weekend in Chicago and hope they can get it going again and keep it going in Minnesota. But uh, looking forward to sharing some thoughts and talking with fans and yourself. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it as well. This is going to be a fun half hour. And if anybody has questions for Doug, they can absolutely uh, ask those questions. If you're joining us tonight via the Zoom, uh, feature. You can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom calls and you can fire away any questions through that way. Uh, or if you have questions and you're watching on Brewers.com, you can ask questions uh, by tweeting at me at Lane Grindle at L-A-N-E-G-R-I-N-D-L-E. -E. Uh, just tweet at me and if you have a question for Doug, uh, we'll try to get that in over the course of the next 30 minutes. We'd love to answer some questions for you uh, from Doug. Let's, let's jump into just Doug Melvin, the baseball man. You, you, you played in the minor leagues, then you started uh, a career in the front office. At, at what point in your life did you know, uh, one, baseball is going to be a big, big part of it, but two, when you got done playing, did you always know when you were done playing, you wanted to be in the front office, you wanted to be somebody that was, was making moves and evaluating players and being part of the development process? Well, growing up, I grew up in a small town in Canada, Chatham, Ontario. I, be, I was a big Detroit Tigers fan, and I always wanted to be Ernie Harwell. Uh, I listened to him, and I wanted to be a radio broadcaster. And as I was playing Little League ball, Ferguson Jenkins was from our hometown in Chatham, yeah. small town of 30,000 people. And when Fergie started becoming the star player, Hall of Fame player he did, then I really gravitated to thinking, boy, I'd love to maybe play pro ball someday. And I signed a contract for $1,000. At that time, there wasn't a lot of Canadians' uh, opportunities to go and play baseball. So I jumped on that and uh, I signed with the Pirates. I played with the Yankees for four years. But in about the fourth year of playing, I realized that I probably, in a self-evaluation, understood that to myself, I probably wasn't going to make the major leagues if I wanted to continue to play minor league ball. And I made that decision uh, after six years of playing. Um, I went to the farm director and Jack Butterfield, his, his son, Brian, is a third base coach, I think with the Angels now. But Jack was a farm director. And I just said, Jack, I think I'm ready to hang it up. Uh, but I want to make sure, will you confirm I'm not a major league player? And he confirmed it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that, and then at that point, uh, my wife and I, Ellen, and I got married, we moved to Canada and Jack called me a few months later and said, Doug, we'd like to have you come back and, uh, if you're interested and George Steinbrenner is creating a job called the eye in the sky. And uh, at that point I, I went back, I threw batting practice for the Yankees and then did defensive charts. And I was, had a walkie talkie up in the, in the press box area um, and down to Yogi Berra in the dugout, who was a bench coach. And we would defense uh, the outfielders that way. But uh, cause George Steinbrenner was, big into football. He was a big football guy. And he always said, how come football has coordinators upstairs and they can see the view of the field? Baseball doesn't do it. So we were the first team to do that. That was back in 1979. Uh, the eye in the sky. Now I don't, they, they don't have it anymore. They wouldn't allow that. They don't allow iPad. I guess they do allow iPads and dugouts now. I'm not sure. But uh, back then we were the first team to do it. And then uh, we did it for about five years and then uh, they put out that we couldn't do it anymore. But Anyway, that's how I got started and uh, very fortunate to be with the Yankees and then became a scouting director and re realized I wanted to be into the player personnel part of the part of the game. I, when you were explaining that, I was like, that just sounds like a football coach up in the in the skybox, yeah. Yeah. you know, looking but, down on the field and, and, and trying to figure out, 
you know, who's cheating where and where, where, where we might be able to get an advantage. And so, yeah, and it's not shocking that George Steinbrenner would, would come up with <laughs> a position like that. He was a big yeah. football guy. And, and so that's, a, that's not a shock at all. Uh, you, you went on, you were with Baltimore for a little bit. Then, of course, you become the, the general manager in Texas. And, and I read where you, you talked about, like, you become the GM and you think you're going to be dealing with all this personnel stuff, but you, you forget that there's all these other things you have to deal with. And Kenny Rogers had just thrown a perfect game. And there was a debate of whether he gets the jersey or the club gets the jersey. Those are <laughs> types of things you don't think about, right? You don't think you're going to be in the middle of those kind of conversations when you're the general manager. But those were kind of some of the oddities that you had to deal with. Yeah, my first year as a general manager with Texas was in, in 94. And and that incident happened where Kenny threw the, the, the no-hitter. And, you know, I said, wow. He said, I didn't know these kind of things would happen as a general manager. But that was he, he, I remember sitting down, he and his wife, and uh, Scott Boris was the agent at the time, and we had a museum in the ballpark, and the, the team wanted to keep the jersey and have a uh, display in the, in the museum in the ballpark, and Kenny wanted it. So tough calls, you know, those are all tough calls. Same as uh, the final out in a World Series, you know. Right. I always see whoever gets that final out sneaks that ball in their back pocket. <laughs> but uh, between that, that was the first, t- uh, first thing that came up. And then my first year as a general manager, we had replacement uh, teams because they were on strike that year. Yeah. And so we had to put a replacement team together that first year. And that's not the kind of thing that I really wanted to get into, but we had to do it. And, uh, it was challenging and, and that, but when I went to Texas, it, it was very similar to when I went into Milwaukee, they had not been to the playoffs in 25 years, the same number as Milwaukee had not been in the playoffs in 25 years. So there were some similarities uh, in Texas and to when I got the job in Milwaukee, I do think the Texas roster probably had more uh, bona fide major league star players on it than when I went into Milwaukee in 2003 or four. Uh, at that time, it was, it was more of a rebuilding. Texas was more of just getting to the playoffs because we had some talented players with Pudge Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez and Rusty Greer and, and, uh, a very talent, they had some very good talent, Kenny Rogers, Darren Oliver, but we just had to put in some pieces and, and try to get to the playoffs. But the, the similarities of not being in the playoffs in 25 years uh, was very exciting for me in Texas when we got there in 1996 and three out of the next four years. But we ran into a big Yankee squad. That was the dynasty team that they had in Jeter's rookie year and were Mariano Rivera and that. So, it was a good time in Texas, but I've spent most of my baseball career now in Milwaukee. Absolutely. And as you said, a lot of parallels in, in the fact that neither organization had been to the postseason in 25 years. You went three times with the Rangers, and then you come to, to Milwaukee and you start building it. And everybody was really thirsty for that, that next postseason um, birth for the Brewers, and, and, and you're able to accomplish that in 2008. And I think – any time anybody talks about Doug Melvin's time with the Brewers, they talk about the long, longevity. They talk about the two playoff uh, berths for sure, but they all talk about the trade and everybody knows what the trade was. And I'm not sure there's ever been a trade that has worked out so well uh, in its history as the CC Sabathia trade. And I know you've been asked about it a million times. We're going to ask you about it again tonight. Just the, the, the genesis, the evolution of that trade, how it came together, and you were able to make it earlier. It wasn't at the dead, d- deadline. You were able to get more out of that trade because you were able to make it uh, much earlier in the season or you know, about a month out, actually, from the deadline. And so you are able to get all those extra starts from CC Sabathia. And, of course, he went on short rest so often as well. But how did that trade come about? How long did it take to finally get it into place? Yeah, well, the reason for wanting to do the trade a month before the end of the deadline is because we're dealing with a starting pitcher. If we were dealing with a positional player, we might not have pushed it that uh, hard because the the positional player is playing every day. But I mentioned to Mark Shapiro, I said, Mark, I know this deal is going to cost me in players, and I'd be willing to give up uh, probably a little better deal by getting CC, you know, a month earlier. And I knew they were very interested in uh, Matt Laporta, who was our first round pick the year before. And Matt was a a good college hitter. And uh, he was the the number one player that was put on the table immediately to try to pique their interest. Whenever you're making a trade with a team, 
I always felt that if you were serious about making a trade, you got to put a player on the table to pique their interest. Otherwise, they'll feel they're, you're, you're just uh, sort of doing some research, trying to get nosy and finding out what's happening. But uh, Laporta did pique their interest at that time and that. And so uh, we continued talking. I think it came together fairly quick. I don't think it was something that took three, four weeks. I think it was mm-hmm. probably a seven to 10 day period. And I know they were talking to the Dodgers too. And then uh, the interesting part of the deal that I, I just talked to Ken Rosenthal asked me about it uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, he called me, he wanted to uh, you know, go over that trade again, but it was when uh, we had player to be named later, Mark and I, I know he had interest in both Michael Brantley and in uh, um, Taylor Green between the two of them. And they were both very good players. If you look them up, they both had really good years in double A. And uh, I really, uh, Brantley was probably the guy we didn't want to give up at that time. Uh, but we did like Taylor Green a lot too. But uh, Michael was a, a year or so younger. But what we decided on, as I said to Mark, how about if we do this? If we go, to, if CC takes us to the playoffs, you get the choice of the two players. And if we don't get to the playoffs, then I get the choice of Taylor Green or Brantley to go to you, and then we'll keep the other one. And that sort of closed the deal for us. There was a, you know, two other players, uh, Zach Jackson involved, and then uh, Rob Bryson was another player that was on a list of three or four players. And I think LaCroix was on that list of players, but they chose Rob Bryson, a young right-handed pitcher who had a good arm. So that's how that deal materialized. And, you know, I think that, was I surprised that we were able to get CC? I, I did feel there was momentum to the deal uh, when La, with Laporta and uh, the possibility of Taylor Green or Michael Brantley. And Zach Jackson was one of our top draft picks too at that time. So I felt there was momentum to it. Uh, but when we made the deal, it, uh, it just uh, it deals in July elevate your clubhouse atmosphere. I think sometimes teams sort of expect it any, anymore. But some years you just can't make a deal. It doesn't happen for certain reasons. But uh, that that's the deal. CC walking in the clubhouse and he came in and was with us the next night. And you could see the energy in the clubhouse just picked up so dramatically when he came aboard. And then watching his performance was just unbelievable. I, there was nobody that expected that kind of performance that he gave us. Yeah, you, know, you just mentioned how it impacts the clubhouse. And it takes me back to 2018, the Brewers, right before the All-Star break, they're, they're right in the mix, midst of everything. We know how that season ended up. And I, we're in Pittsburgh, and I'm actually walking across the Clemente Bridge with Stephen Vogt on our way to the ballpark. And Stephen and I are talking about all the different rumors that are out there about this trade or that trade. Manny Machado was a big name at that point in time. And not talking about any particular name, Stephen just said, you know, here's the thing. As much as we're a really tight-knit group, if the front office goes and makes a couple of big deals to to supplement this group, we're going to embrace it because that means they know we're a winner. They know we can take this a long ways, and and, and that only helps us. And um, I think that speaks to that. I mean, I think it's the front office signaling, right, that we believe in this group. We think this group's got a chance to go a long ways, and so we want to give them everything that they need in order to do that. And, and some people might look at it a different way where they think, hey, we just want this group to be the group. But I don't, I don't think most competitive athletes look at it that way, do they? No. You know, I always felt at the front office, I said, if the team was playing very well and they're busting their tail every game and they're playing hard, then as a front office, we had to bust our tail every day. We had to play hard. We had to go out there and say, let's help the, help the team, reward the team. Maybe we can get somebody that come in and help us yeah. And that's the way I always felt. If the team wasn't playing well, that was always a little bit of a, a, a tough uh, situation because the team's not playing well. Maybe the player could help you get over the hump, whatever. It, it was just a little bit different as opposed to when the team was playing well. And that year when we got CC, uh, the team was playing well. They were playing about as hard as they could play. And and we just needed an additional pitching. And and uh, and he stepped in and helped us because uh, I think it was that year was Giovanni was – Giovanni was hurt that year. Gallardo had hurt and was missing the whole year. And so we needed the extra pitcher at that time. Doug, Rick asks via the Q&A option, he says, of all the great players you were able to bring to the organization, looking back, who would you say was the best draft pick or free agent? Uh, Best draft pick or free agent? 
well, those are, those are things that I always don't think of at the time. Uh, I thought Mike Cameron was a very uh, impactful free agent for us at the time, and, and, and Jason Kendall, too, uh, just because they were, they were uh, tough ball players. They brought a mental toughness to our ball club. And when they, the two of them came in, it was, it was something that we had a, a good group of very young players uh, you know, with Prince and with Ricky and the Corey Hartz and the J.J. Hardys. And that. We had a young team, but we didn't have that veteran uh, presence that, that we needed. And uh, Kendall and Mike Cameron brought a toughness to a ball club that about how important it was to win. We're just not going out there to play. So, you know, maybe they're not the big splash names that uh, people would think, but they were two very talented players that brought something to our clubhouse. Uh, from a makeup standpoint and performance, they're both for heads up ball players. And I think they made, they made everybody else when it was game day, um, you knew that our guys were going to be ready to go out there and step on that field. Jason Kendall would not let up. And you remember Mike Cameron started pulling the shirt tails out, which, which meant that there was a hard day at work. And I think it was his dad who worked and he did, he pulled the shirt tail out and go home. And that, and that's when that thing started about pulling the shirt tails out. So they brought some camaraderie to the team, but I know going into the each each game every night, you knew with Jason Kendall and Mike Cameron that you're going out to play hard to, and you were out to win every game. You know, talking to guys from that era, and and over my five years with the Brewers, I've talked to plenty of them. And in fact, I just did an interview with JJ Hardy maybe about a month ago. They all bring up both of those guys, but a lot of them bring up Mike Cameron as one of those guys that helped turn them into the professional ball players they were later on in their careers, that, that he was the guy that just had such a huge impact on them. And um, you can tell, I mean, everybody in the game that spent time around Mike Cameron has immense amounts of respect for him. And, and, and I, that's a good name. That's, that's an interesting and, one, but some, certainly a guy. Some of, the draft, some of the draft picks, Lane, would be, well, Brandon Woodruff was, was – uh, yeah. There being 11th round pick, we didn't have as much success on our top picks, but we had a lot of success. Our scouts really dug deep, and and uh, we had some success later with the Scooter Jeanette was a later pick. Lorenzo Kane was a 17th mm -hmm. round pick, I believe. Uh, Chris Davis was a later pick, and and that, but uh, we didn't hit on on our top picks, and that that was disappointing that we didn't as much. But Devin Williams now uh, is helping the team, and he he was he was a first rounder. Uh, at that time. And uh, so he, Woodruff, Giovanni, I, I would say Giovanni Gallardo uh, was a very good pick for us. If you look at Giovanni's career, he quietly had a very good career with the Brewers. You could count yeah. on him every, every year. You could count on him every year. He wasn't a guy that just got overly excited. He just went out there and pitched uh, every game, kept you in games. And who can forget, who cannot, you can't forget the series against Arizona when he went out there and, and won and pitched two big games when, when we needed it the most. But I remember at the time, Yovani, I don't think he was the first round. I think he was a second round pick or a comp pick. But I remember uh, Larry Doty was our scout and he said that uh, we should be taking this kid in our first round. But Yovani played in a program down in Texas that uh, some of the scouts were saying it wasn't a talented uh, program that he was in and they were questionable whether uh, we were seeing just a, a good player with a bad, bad league, bad program they were in. But Larry Doty, who was a GM at the time and an old veteran scout pound at the table and said, we need to take this guy in the first round. If we don't take him in the second round, you know, we're making a big mistake. So he, 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 put, his, uh, he put his name on Giovanni Gallardo, and I'm, I'm glad he did because he had a very nice career for the Brewers. You took a pretty good one in 2005, too. In Ryan Braun. Ryan Braun. <laughs> yeah, that's what, how can I forget Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> he worked out yeah. pretty well. <laughs> yeah, he worked out. Ryan is a great player. And I tell you, when we took him, I remember Jack Sorenzik, uh coming to me and he said, Doug, this kid can hit. And everybody's talking about his hit, hitting, but he can really run. And he said that he is a good base runner. He's a heads up and a real instinctive player. And, you know, you're, when you're looking at top draft picks, you're looking for the pitchers of the big power fastballs or the guys that could just flat out hit or big power or whatever. But when Jack said he could really run and, you know, I never see Ryan Braun. He, he reminded me when I saw him after the first few years 
It reminded me a lot of Dave Winfield. When I was with the Yankees, Dave Winfield used to take the extra base and you'd say, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's he doing? But he never got thrown out. And then the same with Ryan. There's times Ryan earlier on in his career, he's going first to third and you say, oh, there's no way. And, all, and he never gets thrown out. And Ryan had great speed, great instincts on the bases. And then we all know what he can do hitting with that bat. He's uh, uh, about as clutch a player as this organization has had in that. And came up as an infielder and weren't sure whether he was going to stay in the infield and, and uh, went to left field is where he spent most of his time. But, yeah, I'm sorry for uh, missing on Ryan. Don't tell him that. So <laughs> <laughs> We won't. Don't worry his about it. Came, his name would have came up somewhere in this yeah. kind of conversation. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the base running. I, to me – it's one of the most underrated skills in, in baseball from a, from a fan standpoint, because I don't think there's anything prettier than like watch, like for me right now, watching Christian Yelich go first to third on a base yeah. hit through the right side is one of my favorite things to watch. I mean, it's, it, it's a thing of beauty in my opinion. Yeah. Scoring from first on a double, you know, those things in the game today with all the strikeouts and home runs, there's not, a, not as much action today, but right. When, when it does happen, it's exciting. And uh, Yelich has a great stride, and he's the same. He's the same type of base runner. You never see Christian get thrown out very often. And he's just got great instincts, and he knows when to, to turn it on and to, to stretch it. And, and uh, he scores so easily from first base on a double that it, it is an underrated thing that we don't talk about enough. And you acquired Craig Council, and now he's the manager, and you were the person in charge when he became the manager. So it's a little unorthodox answer to that question, but that that's worked out pretty well too. Yeah. Craig was, uh, when he was done playing, I knew that he wanted to stay in the game. I think everybody knew that. And, uh, you know, I had conversations with him. I said, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a minor league manager or do you want to be a big league coach? Do you want to be a, a manager of a big league team, front office and GM? A lot of people thought he'd be a great GM. And all the, Craig always told me, I just want to be in a position, a leadership position that can have an impact on an organization. And I said, well, do you have enough money to own the team? Because uh, that's the most impactful is being the owner of the team uh, or be a manager or a general manager. But I talked to him and he came into the front office and worked with me for um, a year and a half. And uh, I think it was very helpful for him to come to the front office uh, and then become the manager. And at that point, uh, after we got off to a rough start the next year, I made a change with Ron Renneke. I went to Craig and said, are you ready to manage now? And he was ready to manage. Yet the year before, he was not. He said, I'm not ready yet. And that was a year that we had, uh, we we're in first place for 150 days and a very disappointing year at the end of the year. But he wanted to be in a leadership position and uh, where he can have an impact on an organization, and that's what he's doing right now. He is impacting the organization. I, I listen to uh, – uh, I'm not in Milwaukee. I'm, I'm on the road, but I listen to a lot of sometimes the visiting broadcasters and all the, the due respect that they, they give Craig Council. He's well-respected around uh, Major League Baseball as one of the top managers in the game. And, and I think we can all see why, too, because he's, he does a great job David has done a great job in providing him the talent and, and Craig has done a great job in, uh, you know, putting it all together and piecing it all together. And sometimes you, you may be ma able to manage your general or may be able to manage a bullpen by committee. Uh, but he's been doing everything. He sort of manages the starters, starters by committee. He does positional players by committee, bullpen by committee. He's, he's done a great job at all of that. And uh, not every manager has the ability to do what, what Craig has been done for the Brewers the last few years. We talked about 2008, comes down to the last day. You, you end up clinching the wild card. Had to feel unbelievable to get Milwaukee back in the postseason. And then 2011, it's a little bit different stakes because it's for the division title, but it comes down to the last day again. Did it feel like deja vu with Ryan Braun doing his thing and everything else that, that – that came with those two 162s? Yeah, well, he just, he had so many clutch hits, you know, with him and Prince and Ricky and, and uh, you know, Corey Hart and the, the players we had, they all came together real well during that period of time. But yeah, the, just the last game when you're winning, what we won 96 games the year of CC, I think, and, and that, but, uh, uh, you know, we had to win that game, I think to avoid a playoff, I think with the Mets, yeah. I think with that game. And uh, 
Ryan, you know, just came up with so many big hits. It wasn't overly surprising, you know, at the, at that point because, you know, other teams respected him so much too. But, you know, he was an MVP and uh, just came up with hit after hit after hit. And he's also a good defensive player. He made some big plays for us. But they both those years were really exciting. The 2008 was exciting because – the, the Brewers hadn't been there before, you know, first we remember we had 11 straight losing seasons. And then we, we then we got to 500. Our, our goal was to just to get to 500 after 11 straight losing seasons. I remember Damian Miller get a home run in Pittsburgh that clinched a 500 season for us, which, you know, you're not overly pleased, but after 11 losing seasons, you're, you're somewhat feeling, okay, we're there now. We got to go to the next level. But I remember asking Damien, do you remember who you hit that home run off of that gave us 500 season? And he, he didn't remember, but it was Ryan Vogel's song. I know general managers remember some of this stuff maybe more than players <laughs> do. And that, but it was a big hit, and Damien was a big part of that team. Damien Miller was. But 08 was so exciting because of uh, just not being there in the 25 years. And, and there was some hope and some, uh, you know, hope for us to go on and be, be good the next few years. But you know, it's always challenging. The window's not always open as as wide as you'd like it to be uh, when you're doing all this because of free agency and because of when players are uh, in their contract years or whatever. But uh, there are very exciting times. I go back a lot of times and look on the look on the replays of those games of Ryan's home runs off Bobby Howry and uh, that. And that, it never gets old. And the, the, the five-game series with the Diamondbacks, and those, those games never get old. CC got the double play ball. Uh, and that final game, Derek Lee hit the, the ground ball double play. And uh, the, they, they never gets old. And that's a lot of times I'll stay up and watch those highlights. And uh, the Brewers have had a lot of highlights the last few years, too, with David and Craig and done a, done a great job. Okay, I want, and we have a little bit of time left. And I want, I want yep. to talk about the current state of baseball with what's going on with the shortened season with the COVID protocols, it's, it's really been interesting, I think, for everybody to, to watch and to follow. And from somebody like you, uh, who probably looks at it through the lens of a general manager, how hard would this be to manage a 60-player roster and your 40-man and auxiliary camp and following the protocols? And you got a trade deadline coming up in a couple of weeks now. And how, how's that going to work? And will teams be as aggressive as they normally are? This is a really fascinating thing to watch, in my opinion, and I'm sure you've been just blown away by some of it. Well, it would be very difficult. It'd be tougher than telling Kenny Rogers we want his uniform for the museum or tougher than putting a replacement team together <laughs> it, it, because you probably go, David probably goes to bed every night and hopes that when you wake up the next morning, you don't have a couple positives. Right. And that's got to that's weigh on you. You know, we used to, I always used to tell people, uh, as a general manager, you always lived in fear of an injury, you know. You get a fear of an injury. Like game that After the game's over that night, you just hope somebody doesn't come in tomorrow and say, I think I blew my elbow out or I, my knee or whatever. You lived in fear of injuries. There's nights you didn't go to sleep when somebody uh, somebody reported an injury to Roger Kaplinger after the game that night. Right. You're wondering, gosh, do I is he going to be out for two weeks or whatever? Is this a – well, Yavani Gallardo missed the whole year that one year. Ricky Weeks was hurt a lot. But I'm sure that David goes to bed every night or every general manager does and hopes that when they go up, go to the park the next day, they're not going to get a call and say, we got three or four guys testing positive. So I'm sure there's a lot of sleepless nights going through front offices and ownership groups and manage managers and general managers with what's going on today. And, um, you know, the medical staff headed up by Roger Kaplinger, all the medical staff has done a great job and there's, you got to be more disciplined. You know, it's a game that you got to be disciplined at when you're playing the game, you got to be more disciplined away from the ballpark than ever, ever before. And that's always a tough thing to put through a young player's mind, the discipline that's required. If you want to continue to play and collect your paycheck and continue to play for the love of the game and continue to play for the industry, you need to be more disciplined than ever away from the park than you've ever been in your whole career. And so it has been very tough. And as I said, I hate to, to see when there's a couple of positives and then the team doesn't play for four days or five days and, and whatever. And I had, uh, had mentioned to someone that 
we need to get this straightened out before the playoffs because I just don't see how it would be very difficult and very challenging to have what's happened recently where a team has to not play for six days. That would be very difficult in the playoffs. So I hope that this all gets straightened out and it uh, doesn't happen once the playoffs roll around because I've enjoyed watching the games. There's, some, there's intensity to the games. Uh, I've enjoyed watching all the games. I enjoy watching the – and I'm hoping the playoffs are going to be the, the same way with a lot of intensity that teams have shown. Doug, do you think a baseball bubble can work? I know there's been people that have talked about it. Um, nobody on record of any official capacity yet, but it's been – floated out there a little bit. Do you think that there's a logistical way to pull off a bubble when it comes to baseball? Well, I, I talked to John Hammond, the uh, former Milwaukee Bucks GM and Orlando Magic GM about the bubble the other, just two days ago. And he said it's worked very well. They've done a great job. Uh, the only problem I see in baseball is I don't see how you can play all those games in one ballpark or even two ballparks. They'd be tearing up the field and, yeah. In a field, the condition of the fields might not be proper. I could see considering regional bubbles where maybe the West Coast uh, teams go from San Diego to Anaheim to Dodgers ballpark. Maybe there's a, a regional bubble in that regard. Uh, Midwest, you got the Miller Park, you got two Chicago's. Just to mi try to minimize travel. I could see that where you don't have to get on airplanes, you don't have to airplane to a bus, to, a, to the hotel, whatever. Maybe you can, even if they're close enough, you might just uh, do a road trip, go and play and go home that night, you know, like mm -hmm. we used to do in the minor leagues. Uh, but I could see a regional bubble being a consideration. You know, Rob Manfred's got so much on his plate as a commissioner. I'm not making recommendations for them, but it would be hard to do in one city. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen college tournaments in one city before and the fields are torn up, right. you know, three days later when you've had uh, four ball games every day for four days, it's hard to keep those fields. And, and the other part of it is too, if you got one field and, and you have rain, all of a sudden you got four games rained out. Yeah. Uh, right. If you're, you know, if you're in a regional bubble, you might be able to, to, uh, to play a game uh, in the afternoon or one at night. So, you know, one city, I would think it would be difficult, almost impossible. Doug, a couple quick questions for you before we let you go. Um, take 08 and 11 out of it. Do you have a favorite memory during your time as the general manager of the Brewers that really stands out to you that maybe is a little bit more unknown or a, a little bit different of a story besides the, the very obvious ones? Uh, those two are, are, are clearly going to be at the top of your list, I would think. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um... Well, I think just getting hired and getting the opportunity to be the general manager of the Milwaukee Brewers was special for me uh, in, in, in my mind, too. I got fired in Texas and getting a second chance, and Wendy Seelig hired me. And then I got to thank, and I thanked Mark Athanasio for this a, a couple times. I said, you know, Mark, you inherited me as a general manager, and I ended up, I'm still with the Brewers. How many years later? Yeah. You know, 16 years later. And I said, I got inherited in Texas. Uh, Tom Hicks inherited me as a general manager, and I was fired in the second, uh, second year or third year after uh, being uh, working with Tom Hicks. But I, uh, I give Mark a lot of credit for inheriting me and giving me the opportunity for such a lengthy period of time. But there's so when you got that many years, there's so many good memories uh, in that, uh, I know that there was a stretch there where there was like a five year stretch where we had like five all stars every year for five straight years or something. And, and that's a real credit to your scouting staff, right? To your player development staff. I always thought we had one of the top player development staffs in baseball because if you look, we, we didn't hit on our top picks, but I named a lot of uh, picks later in the drafts that guys got them to the big leagues and, and that's so the real credit to them. But, we, Wendy Seeley given me the opportunity to come into Milwaukee because it's such great history uh, with Milwaukee Brewers and Milwaukee Braves baseball and to be with a franchise uh, and be with that many fans. Uh, I, I think drawing the fans of, you know, the other part of it is uh, the years you played in front of a million, five million, seven million, eight, drawing three million fans in Milwaukee was a real thrill too. And that's, that's away from the field, but it's, it's the fans that came out to watch the games 
And it's always very rewarding for a general manager. If they're getting that many fans coming out watching, I think they like the product. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there's no question about that. Hey, kind of a personal note yep. for you. A couple of years ago, you became an American citizen, which I know is a, a cool deal for you on a personal level. Uh, we mentioned earlier in the interview how you grew up in Canada. You're a Cana you were a Canadian uh, citizen uh, up until just a couple of years ago. Your time in Texas, you, you worked for a future president for a little bit. And, um, you know, he goes on and becomes president. Did, did you hear from W when you became an American citizen? Yes, I did. Uh, Dan Larea and people had helped out. And when I, I had a, a U.S. citizenship party, and my wife put on for me. We had about 30 people in the backyard. And I had a, uh, a letter from George Bush. Uh, with my picture on it, holding the, I think, holding the American flag. And, and he wrote me a beautiful letter that I have framed and uh, signed from him because he had, uh, he had hired me in Texas. He was one of the three ownerships at the time back in 1994. But receiving that letter during that day, I got very emotional about it when I received that letter. And, and I opened up that uh, present from Dan Larray, our traveling secretary. He'd done a wonderful job through security because they're not e always easy to get to. You just can't pick up the phone and call former presidents. <laughs> really? <laughs> I didn't going, know that. <laughs> without going through a lot of people. And I don't know how Dan Larea did it. And, and I just said to him, I said, I'm unbelievable to be able to get this. But it was a, a very uh, congratulatory letter and uh, from George Bush. And we were at Walker's Point with uh, Barbara Bush and, and uh, in 41, George Bush, we got invited there for a dinner one night. Walt Jockety, his wife, he was a GM at the Cardinals at that time. And it was very interesting at that time when I sat at a table with Barbara Bush and I asked her, I said, if I bought a book of your husband, which book should I buy? That's really, you know, there's so many books out there on presidents. And she said, well, he loved writing letters and writing letters is sort of a lost art today. Yeah, and he loved about he loved writing letters. And when we got back to Milwaukee, we had a book autographed by George Bush on his letter writing. The book that he has, he's sitting at his desk writing letters, and it's about all these letters that he wrote to worldwide leaders and letters that he had while he was in office. So uh, that meant a lot to me, uh, just to sit down and have that relationship with the Bush family. Absolutely. And, and you're right. Uh, writing letters is a lost art. And it, there's something about getting a letter in the mail uh, that somebody took the time to think of you and to write. Um, it, it is. It's, it's, yeah. We don't do it very much anymore, but when we no. do get one of those, it, it's pretty special. And, and there are some that really still subscribe to that as being a, a great touch point. And, and I think it really has an effect when, when, it, when you do utilize it hey we we thank you we've taken you a little yeah. bit over time but we appreciate no you Doc, being gracious with your time as always um you're one of the great guys in baseball and uh, we're really proud you're still a part of the brewers organization will be for a long time and and thank you for spending some time with us here tonight on clubhouse conversations thanks lane i enjoyed it very much thank you you bet doug melvin with us here on clubhouse conversations there will not be a wednesday episode this week we will be back with you again next Monday, and we'll be announcing that guest at some point later on this week. So check out the social media channels as we bring you that name in the next few days. Thank you for joining us here tonight. We have certainly appreciated it. A big thanks to Doug Melvin as well. That's going to do it for us. We will talk to you tomorrow night as the Brewers get set to take on the Twins in a three-game series in the Twin Cities. Have a great night, everybody.